Hey guys, this is Mark. In this video, I'd like to give you an overview of the Business Logic screen in Backendless Console version 4. The Business Logic screen has been redesigned and looks very different than what you might have seen in the previous version of Backendless. We tried to simplify the interface and organize the information differently to make it easier to work with business logic. There are three different types of business logic supported by Backendless API services, which is the code you deploy into Backendless, and based on that code, Backendless automatically generates API services, generates REST routes, and allows you to download SDKs for, for your service. Event handlers and timers they can plug in directly into your application and become an inherent part of it. Let's start with event handlers, then we'll talk about timers, and then move on to API services. The interface you see on the screen uh, gives you an ability to create new event handlers and manage the ones that you have deployed or are working on. You will see there are three checkboxes here, and I don't have any event handlers yet, and these checkboxes will become quite handy once you have event handlers in place. So let's create an event handler and we will use JavaScript for this, although the process for Java would be identical. And uh, this event handler is going to be for data tables. The event is create, meaning this event is fired every time whenever a new object is being created in a backendless table. If you want to associate this event with a specific table, then you can uh, select it in the context. So in this case, these are the tables that I have in my application, but the event handler I'm going to create will apply to all tables. Once you click save, the event handler is created. And as you can see, there is a category data tables that shows this event. Let me create another one. And this one will be for the users category. So anytime user registers, then this event handler will be fired. So as you can see, there are two sections here, data tables, and users. So any event handlers you create for the persistence storage, uh, the backendless database, will show up in this section data tables. Any event handlers you create for the user service will show up here. So different types of event handlers will be grouped by the service that that event handler belongs to. Now there is a color coding scheme here. Notice that the draft uh, is marked as blue and these event handlers have the same color as draft. So this means that these event handlers are in the draft mode. And draft would be fairly similar to the code generation mode that we had in the previous version of Backendless. What this indicates is these event handlers are in sort of the editing mode. They're not deployed into production and uh, at this point you can just change those event handlers and then publish them into production. You can expand this event handler and see exactly the code that has been generated. And uh, starting with backendless 4, you can edit this code right here by uh, injecting whatever the code that needs to be executed every time when a new object is persisted in backendless. So here, the comments, they give you an idea of how to reference that object that is being persisted. So rack.item is going to be the actually the object that is being persisted. So for instance, if we type in rag.item.new prop, then this property will be created whenever object is persisted. Created by business logic. At this point, if I were to just save it, then it is still in draft and uh, uh, saving it just essentially saves that copy on the server, but it is still in the draft mode. To deploy this code to production, you could use this button. Now notice the tooltip says save and deploy all. What this means is the deployment process will take all of your event handlers from draft into production, meaning that this specific event handler for users, even though it is empty, will also be deployed to production. It will not do anything because there is no custom code here, but it will also be deployed. So let's deploy this particular change into production and see what happens. It is deployed now, and you will notice that in addition to these blue event handlers, meaning the draft ones, you also have event handlers in production. And using these checkboxes, you can always filter and see the ones which are in production. So right now you have two event handlers in production. Going back to the draft mode and making additional changes is absolutely okay. You can continue making these changes 
and periodically deploying them to production will put them into production. So at this point, before create is in there and we can confirm this just by saving a data object in a data table. So for this, I'm going to switch to data. I will create a new uh, table. I will call this table order and we'll declare order ID uh, column. So in here, order is selected. I'm switching to rest console and we'll type in order ID equals A, B, C, D, just to keep things simple. So by issuing the put request, that object goes out to the server, it's being saved, and you will see that there is a new property added to this object, and this property is added by business logic. And by going back to data browser, we see that there is a new property declared in this table called new prop created by business logic is the value. Returning back to business logic event handlers, uh, the debug mode works exactly the same way as before. So if you have a local code runner running on your developer computer and you run your business logic in the local debug mode of code runner, any event handlers located in the debug mode on your computer will show up with this red color code and you will be able to see them here as well. Very similarly, if you were to switch to timers and create a new timer, and let's call it my cool timer. We will say that it runs every, say, 60 seconds. So now we have this timer. And right here, we can just add custom business logic code that, for example, can just save data in the back analyst table. Back analyst data of log info So this is very trivial business logic that just saves an object into the log info table every time this timer runs. So here we're going to click this button and uh, the timer will be deployed into production. There you go. The timer is in there and now every minute, every 60 seconds, it will run and save data in the back analyst table. So we'll check back on this just to see how those objects are being created in the log info table. And some additional controls to be aware of specifically for this timer. Now it is that for the timer that is in the production mode, you can enable and disable the timer using this particular toggle. You can edit the timer by clicking this and here you can change the schedule of the timer. You can completely delete the timer by using this uh, icon right here or run the timer on demand just by clicking this button. Okay, let's check if uh, we have a table that uh, is where the timer is writing the data to. So there you go, we have this log info table created by the timer and there is one message right here. Okay, let's go back to business logic again. So at this point, we have a couple of event handlers. We do have a timer and uh, you can edit them right here. But in addition to editing event handlers and timers right there on the corresponding pages, there is a new section in business logic uh, screen called coding. And coding really combines all of the code that has been generated and deployed into one unified in interface. So you can see that there is a before create a JavaScript uh, event handler. There is one for the user service and there is one for timers. So all of the code is in a single place. You can add, edit your model by adding additional folders. So here I'm going to create a folder that will contain my services. And right there you can actually add new files. So let's call it myservice.js. So notice that the color is also green, meaning that it has not been saved, it is in the draft mode. And in here you can uh, add your own service code and deploy it into production and it will appear in the API services screen. I will start with a very basic service that uh, essentially would be akin to 
uh, hello world service. So for this, I'm gonna first declare the global backendless scope. And let me declare my hello world service. The service will have one uh, function, hello world. But for now, we'll not take any arguments. We'll just keep it as basic as it can get. And now we'll uh, create additional services to show the complexity that exists in there. So in here, let's return hello world. Now, this class is just a, a JavaScript class with one function, but to make it a service, it needs to be registered with backendless using the following API. The service is ready. All it takes is just the registration of the service class, and now we will deploy it to production. Here you go, it is deployed. And by switching to the API services section, we'll see that now there is there is this hello world service and uh, it has one method, hello world. Invoking the method is as simple as clicking the invoke button. The invocation took place, you see the response headers and then the actual body of the uh, response is right here. And then you can also see the request and from there get the CURL, which would be invoking that operation. Uh, console automatically generates native SDKs that you can get to make the invocations of this specific service. Returning to coding, uh, let's create another service that will be more complex. And uh, we'll create a new file and uh, let's call it greeting service. And for the greeting service, I will use a service that we have in GitHub as uh, one of the demo services. If you go to github.com slash backendless and select JavaScript code runner, you will see the code for various simple services which exist out there. So here, uh, it's also a fairly simple service, but it is uh, unique in a way where uh, when the service is registered, and you can see we're registering greeting service class that also contains one method, now it takes an argument. Uh, we're also declaring configuration parameters for this service. Let me deploy it first, show how it works, and then we'll go back to the code so you can understand how all these things come together. So now the service is deployed. By going to API services, we see there are two services now, hello world, which uh, I invoked before I added the greeting service. And here's the greeting service. So in the username, if I type in mark and invoke, in the response, you see welcome mark. Now, regarding those configuration options, by clicking the gear icon, we see that there is a drop down menu language, and then these are the options which become available. So, if I select German and click save, next time the invocation of that service takes place, it will provide that additional context from the current selection. So, here I click invoke, and notice that the response is now in German. By going back to coding, uh, let's put it all together. So this is going to be the description of that additional configuration parameter. The display name is language. The variable that will contain the current value is going to be link. Now notice in the body, in the implementation body of that service, we reference that lane parameter right here. And by using this dictionary, we get specific value that corresponds to the selection. And that's how we return the value back to the user. If you were to go to that uh, GitHub repository, you'll see a more complex example, which is shopping cart, which you can just copy and paste into your service and see it running as well. And uh, uh, all the API services are here and the interface is significantly simplified than before. When it comes to Java, uh, with Java, you cannot edit code the same way I just did with JavaScript. So for editing the code, you would still need to do it locally. You can generate all the event handlers, just like uh, you did before. So here's a new event handler in Java, let's say for files. So before, for let's say file upload. 
click save and uh, here it is files and there is a p4 upload and it says that this code this event handler is in java and if for javascript you can expand and edit it right there in the console for java you cannot do this the download button will give you an ability to download either all the java code or javascript code as a project that you can continue editing and debugging locally and then deploying it to uh, event handler uh, previously uh, the way it worked in backendless you would have to choose either javascript or java but now you can combine different types of event handlers and timers in the same project same thing with api services so if i go to api service and create a new service there is a new uh, there is a sample service that i could use right here shopping cart click save and now I have uh, a Java service that is also part of all the services in console. Here it is in vacation, and we get the response that gives you the instructions on how to use this specific service. So this is an overview of business logic. Uh, uh, it should be significantly easier to work with. It will take maybe just a little bit of time to get used to it if you're coming from Backendless 3. But for anyone who's new to Backendless and can be starting their exploration of backendless with version 4, it should be very easy to get around and navigate the new interface. If you have any questions, please send us an email or submit a topic on the support forum. We'll be happy to help out. And uh, there will be many more videos uh, for various specific features, not just with Business Logic, but with the rest of the platform. So thank you, and as always, happy coding.